If Reality Check Radio enriches your day and life, support us to keep bringing you the content, voices, perspectives, and dose of reality you won't get anywhere else. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate. Simon Lusk is a hunting buddy of mine, and we've also done plenty of political hunting together, but that'll probably be for our book. I've asked him back, despite his views on Jacinda Ardern, to see if we can plot a course for the Labour Party to find their way forward. He joins me on the line now. Welcome back to The Crunch, Simon Lusk. You're famous on The Crunch as the person who said Jacinda Ardern was nice. We had so much email about that. Well, that's quite incorrect, Cam. I never said she was nice. I said she was lovely. (laughs) Well, now we'll have even more emails. Well, I also said that she was thick and not competent, but she was genuinely lovely. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you on thick and not competent, but um, we'll have to disagree on the lovely. Although I did have lunch with her in 2008, but um, David Farrell was besotten um, with her at the end of that lunch, and I said to him, she's as dumb as a bag of hammers, David. How can you, you know, like that? And he says, oh, well, you know, I think she's going places. So maybe he was right and I was wrong, but. Maybe, maybe. I, I, I have huge admiration for her as a person and, and almost none as a politician. She was ab- an abject failure as Prime Minister and, and really failed to deliver on any of her key pro- promises. And that's the key thing, isn't it? Labor's sitting there with Chris Hipkins boxing on, mainly because there's nobody else to replace him. But they're sitting there thinking that the electorate got it wrong and they haven't had the the nous to sit down and think. Well, actually, is it a legacy of all the overpromising and underdelivering, or is it a legacy of our nanny statism, or is it a legacy of the divisiveness that has occurred as a result of the policies we push through? And so, it seems that they seem a bit directionless. It's almost like they're relying on people to wake up. And we saw this in 2002, didn't we, when Bill English arrogantly thought he was going to win the election um, because the voters got it all wrong and Labour will only be in for one term and then we'll get back in. It's the same sort of thinking that we're seeing now with Labour, isn't it? Well, and and the nine years for the uh, three elections with John Key where he beat them, absolutely smashed them really, and they just kept waiting for people to think John Key was something other than what he was, which was both competent and likable. He might not have done very much, but no one could accuse him of not being competent, and the, his likability remained very high. I mean, most people would welcome to have a drink with John Key. Very few people would want to have a dr- drink with Chris Hipkins, but that's probably because he drinks shandies. Oh, and uh, pink cocktails while he's watching the, the Boxing Day Test match. I mean, yeah, I, I think part of being in the modern uh, Labour Party is uh, you got to hand in your man card, and it's it's why guys like Nashi and Chainsaw never really did that well in there because they wouldn't. Hmm. So what is the Labour Party going to do moving forward or what should they do? You know, I've got some ideas. You've got some ideas. Let's chew the fat on this one and see if we can steer them in a direction that might see them being competitive at the next election. Well, the first thing they've got to do is concentrate on winning a majority in Parliament. And, you know, if they if they concentrate on anything else, they're largely wasting their time. Um, they've got to get to 61 or whatever the majority is in Parliament, and they've got to probably do that via a coalition. Um, and, you know, if they spend their whole time navel-gazing about uh, whether they need a weight wealth tax or something, it's just not relevant. Um, and no one really wants to vote for someone that looks backwards all the time either. They, they need to be looking forward. And, you know, they, they've got bloody good pollers in Talbot Mills. Those guys know what they're doing. They've been around for ages and they learned from Fat Tony, who was a genius. And, you know, um, they should spend very, very heavily on research in the next six months, especially the qualitative stuff. They need really deep-seated research to understand what the public are thinking, what the public care about, um, where they got it wrong and where the opportunities are, what what do people think of Luxon and what are their attack lines on Luxon? What are the the criteria for um, for success? 
Um, and, you know, while it can't be done with Chris Hipkins, they really seriously need to be thinking about who goes and buys a case of whiskey and goes and has a, a, a peace conference with New Zealand first. Um, they probably won't because they now think Winston is evil, but, you know, they, they should, probably should do that. Um, but in principle, what they've really got to do is work out the issues that matter to voters and fight on those. And, you know, don't don't fight the last war and, and don't spend too much time worrying about um, things that, that won't have much impact. Like, you know, if Winston wants to have a go at the media for being biased, well, I think our good mate Farah has proven that the most New Zealanders, including half of Labour voters, think they are biased. So stop fighting them on that and start fighting on the cost of living or, you know, immigration or, or something where they can make a material difference to people's lives rather than just nibbling around the edges. I've seen a few of the... I, I describe them as hard left media commentators saying that if only Labor had um, brought in a wealth tax as their policy mix, if only they had um, extended capital gains tax, if only they had removed GST off um, fruit and vegetables, all of these things that they've been talking about. And they seem to think that we'll vote for more taxes. And the empirical yeah. evidence suggests that the opposite is true. If you propose new taxes or more taxes, very rarely do you succeed. I mean, Helen Clark famously raised the top tax rate, but she said it was only going to apply to 5% of tax payers. I mean, it was a lie. Um, it applied to far more than 5%. Yeah. But she's the only one I can think of that got away with proposing an increased tax. Uh, it, albeit yeah, on a small portion of the population. I, and, and I think this is something that the left don't understand. Um, they don't, the, the, the average voter doesn't mind people being wealthy. Um, they, they, they like to think that they one day might make it. And they also think that the government wastes most of the money they get, so they resent paying taxes. So more taxes is not a, a, an issue that's going to win you um, votes on. You know, it's like, it's just not. You know, do well. We've got to tax these people more, and well, why? You guys just wasted it anyway. And you know, that's one of the things they're going to have to deal with. They they set up a whole lot of useless bureaucracies that have cost a vast fortune, and service has gone down. Um, you know, our, our education system is a uh, an abject failure, and our health system is just way worse than when National were in power. Um, and they've got to get their heads around, you know, the difference between spending money and delivering results. We've seen this with a number of politicians. I mean, Stephen Joyce wrote an article um, about a week ago in the New Zealand Herald where he was this newfound fan of devolution and putting decision-making out to the regions. But he was the minister that created MB, this massive yeah. ministry that centralised a whole lot of work streams around, and now he's saying that we need to have devolution and in, in some respects, I agree with them. But there seems to be in the Labour Party this preponderance of thinking that central government knows best and that we're best to merge all the politics, merge all the hospitals uh, and, and health boards and everything else, merge everything into this one big amorphous beast that is sitting there in Wellington sucking the life out of the New Zealand economy. And they never seem to have, I mean, the last rational thought they had about this sort of stuff was when Roger Douglas was their finance minister. And, and maybe they need to yeah, actually look, start thinking about these things more. Well, I, I, I think that, you know, the whole argument about centralisation or decentralisation is just, you know, I, I live in Hawke's Bay. No one cares. They just don't care. And this is the trap that Labor fall into. They think that people actually do care. And if they just could educate them a bit more, they would. What they do care, what the voters here are listening for is, how are you going to make my life better? Um, mm. How are you going to get the cost of living down? You know, how are you going to make housing more affordable? Because bloody hell, Kiwi Build was just a disgrace. I mean, you guys were just useless. Um We've got to have a plan that will work. And, you know, they've got to, Labor need a plan that they can say, this will work unlike in the last six years. Um, and, you know, that that's a really important point. They need to be thinking about probably the 97% of people that aren't interested or aren't listening. Um, and how do you get some cuts through to them? Um, and I don't know that they, you know, that if they want to 
keep going on about centralisation and big bureaucracies. You know, you turn up at the A&E ward and you don't get seen for 12 hours or you think is the government's useless, not, oh, it's great, we've got a new bureaucracy. Um, and that's the kind of thing where the voters just have lost trust in government a lot because Labor was so inept and couldn't deliver anything. And, you know, they've got to work hard on saying our plans will work this time because we have done this, not, oh, well, we dreamed up 100,000 houses for Kiwi Build without addressing the problems of building houses to begin with. I mean, take the health sector, for example. I mean, Andrew Little, in the middle of a pandemic, had this rush of shit to the brains where he thought, we'll reorganise the health system, we'll get rid of all the health boards, we'll give them some flash Maori names and issued all these badges, all the staff have got their Te Whatu Ora badges on and everything, but the services never improved. Nothing changed. went backwards. It went backwards in mm. many respects, and people are sitting there thinking, why is the Labour Party fighting over Maori names for government departments when the government departments don't bloody work in the first place? I mean, they want the health system yeah. to see them quickly, they want the roads to have no potholes and to be fixed and repaired, uh, you know, with great alacrity. They don't want some fancy – I mean, I, I imagine you're getting the same feedback that I'm getting from people on the street where they're saying, oh, I'm just – thank God we can actually say things as they are now um, without yeah, any, yeah. all these woke wombles, you know, frowning at us because we're not pronouncing something correctly or or whatever. And, and I think that leads on to, to really Labor's biggest strategic opportunity, although I'm not sure that they will really embrace it, which is coalition politics. They need to have a coalition to form a government. And they've got the, the absolute Fruit Loop Greens who are going to um, take up all the loony green vote. Um, but they've also got the Maori Party. And the Maori Party is always going to out-Maori Labor. And there's no point in Labor fighting them because it only takes left-wing votes. Labor has to move to the middle and expand the, the coalition towards the middle. And, you know, the, getting into an argument about what a government department is called when no one really knows what it is or how to pronounce it, it's just it just doesn't have any bearing on on the average person's life. It is a, um, as, as Matt Goodwin in the, um, the U.S., uh, sorry, in the UK, rights. He he always talks about it being the luxury belief class. You know, the luxury belief class here thinks that all this Tereo is going to change the the uh, the way that Maori succeed in New Zealand, and it's just it's yeah, it's, it defies common sense. Um, and you know that that means that you probably you know your mate Willie Cam, who's a bloody good guy, and I love reading what he writes. I don't agree with much of it, but at least mm. he tells us what he thinks, which most of them don't. And you know, good on him for that. But if Labor try and out Maori the Maori Party, they're just going to alienate a whole lot of immigrants and a whole lot of white working class voters who should be voting for Labor because they'll be going, "You bastards care more about those people than you do about me," so I'm not going to vote for you. And, you know, that that is what they will be thinking and what they have done. So they've got to get away from the trap of the treaty because it won't win elections. And I would spend quite a lot of time working, getting Murray elected. They're wonderful candidates, mm. far better than anyone else. But, you know, you you need to be talking about results for Murray, not Toreo. You know, housing, education, health, employment. And results, not bureaucracies. You know, the, the whanau here, my fiance is Maori, and the whanau are all, um, you know, they care about things like, is are there going to be enough houses? Are the kids going to get a decent education? Can they get nanny in to see a doctor when they need to? They don't really care that much about te reo. And quite a lot of them, their kids have learnt the reo at home, and now they're in, in normal schools learning English because they've already got it. And, you know, Arguing that kind of stuff just puts people off. And I'm sure the qualitative research would say that if they got Talbot Mills to do the work and they actually listened to them. Um, and that, that leads on to the next point, which is, you know, they, they really probably should sit down with the Maori party and say, guys, like, you're going to look after the Maoris. We've got to win over the middle ground and then we can work together to improve things and uh, that we all agree on. But why not get your voters to party vote uh, Labor, and we'll get our voters to electorate vote Maori, and we'll create a bigger overhang, 
and will make it harder for the right to do all the things that we don't want them to do by being in government. And, you know, that that is something that a sensible Labor Party would be considering. Now, I don't believe they will. I, I think that their luxury belief uh, people in the, 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 you know, the white urban liberals all couldn't stomach that and the Maori part, uh, Maori part of the caucus would be, oh, no, we've got to win over Maori voters, they're ours. But, you know, you, you and I, we're pretty cold-blooded about these things. We'd do anything to win if we were running Labor and we would go and have that chat with the Maori Party. But it seems to me that the Labor Party has a problem now and it's their coalition partners because if you vote yeah. Labor, you're going to get the Fruit Loops and the Greens who don't say anything sensible ever. Uh, who seem to like playing dress ups as much as the Maori Party like playing dress ups in Parliament, um, but by and large, they're not an environmental party. They're a, a hard left socialist party, if not communist in many regards. And then you've got the Maori Party that has morphed from something that was respected when it was run by Tariana Turia and Peter Sharples into something where they're actually a laughing stock and most people are, are laughing at them, not with them. Yeah, although I think that they have a substantial constituency. I think there is a constituency for both the Greens and the Maori Party. And if you're just looking to get to 61 votes in Parliament, you've got to work out what is the most efficient way of doing it. And you can shave off some of the loony stuff that those parties want to do from your own portfolio. So Labor becomes a sensible mainstream party that's okay to vote for for the average voter. You've still got to deal with them in government, but you're better off dealing with them in government than fighting them in opposition. Yeah, I mean, still, if you're trying to convince that squishy middle to not vote for national, because, I mean, let's face it, that's where the squishy middle sits is in the national party at the moment, and go with Labour, then having the lunatics of the Greens and the racists of the Maori Party as your only potential coalition partners because of your, you know, decisions that you've made over a period of time isn't going to, you know, endear voters to wanting to swap across to to the Labour Party because if you vote for Labour, you oh, get them. Definitely not. They, they really need to, you know, when, when they cut Hipkins' throat, which I'm sure they will be forced to at some point, um, they need the, the first move is, is they've got to turn up at New Zealand First Caucus with a big case of whiskey and sit there and drink it with them and, and have a peace conference. You know, that, that would give them more flexibility to move further to the right and stop the loonies from on the left from causing too many problems. Um, and, you know, none of this is, is particularly... Um, uh, well, it's not rocket science. And the, the guy that writes the best on all of this kind of stuff, in my view, is a, a pommy guy called Matt Goodwin, who, who's got a great Substack uh, site. And he's written a brilliant book called Values, Voice and Virtue, which is basically how the left in Britain has managed to alienate their traditional working class voters. And the same applies in the US. Uh, and I think the same applies here. Um, you know, they, they, they emphasise values of the of the you know the the luxury belief class rather than the values of the the people that are working hard to get ahead um, they've denied them the voice uh, that they had in parliament because they there's very few working class people left in the labor party um, and their view of virtue is is doing stupid stuff on trans and and things like that rather than what the average working class voter thinks and you know, I, I'd be making that mandatory reading for every member of the Labor caucus um, and look at what can be implemented that he talks about in Britain um, here. And, and the first thing that I'd be implementing is a, a really aggressive policy on um, on immigration to reduce immigration, to get housing prices down and services um uh, public services available to New Zealanders because that's you know that's just something that is offensive when you see all these new people turn up, block the roads, take the houses, take the um, and and clag up your schools and your health system. And they go, well, why why are we letting these people in? Because they're also driving our wages down. And you know that argument could be a very very powerful one for Labor if they can get their heads round. They've got to stop going on about virtue and, and looking after the, the minorities and start looking after hardworking New Zealanders. And, and hardworking New Zealanders are the, are the majority, although I was shocked to see the other day um, some statistics 
particularly around the Labour Party's unfunded promises that Treasury were absolutely slating after the fact. Shame they never said it beforehand. But they said that Labour's promises around infrastructure and what they were wanting to spend was going to require the magical appearance of 100,000 skilled workers. And then in the article, it went on to say that the current workforce is around 880,000 people. Either it was a typo, yeah, I mean, either it was a typo, or it just shows how few working people there are in New Zealand. I mean, I think yeah, well, 180,000 like, seems rather small. I mean, I think 1.8 million might be more um, more appropriate, given we've got a population of five million. Yeah, look, I I think that there's some um, some big issues in terms of. Yeah, getting people who aren't working back to work. And it's not unique to New Zealand. Britain now has one in five working age adults on a benefit or out of work benefit. And you know, I'm sure that we have a similar sort of problem where uh, for both structural reasons and because we just let bludgers get away with it, they stay on the benefit for life rather than getting out and working. And there's plenty of jobs, That's uh, but we're not really pushing them. Now that, you know, if, if Labor were really serious, they'd say, look, our name states what we believe in. You work. We're the labour movement. We're not the bludger movement. We're not the beneficiary movement. We believe in and everyone having to do their bit for society, and that means working. And, you know, I think that the other really, um, one of the, the best lines I think I've ever heard in politics was when um, Julia Gillard rolled Kevin Rudd, and she said, I want to be the prime minister for the Australians that work the hardest, not those who complain the loudest. And I great think line. too often here, great Labor, line, isn't it? Just yeah, a great you just think, yeah, all well, that's bloody right, mm. you know, and that that should be Labor's mantra. We want to look after the New Zealanders that work hardest, not those that complain the loudest, and that have all sorts of people saying, "Hallelujah!" Someone finally gets it. I don't. I really resent the fact that I'm, you know, doing two jobs. I'm getting up really early, and I see my useless bloody neighbour who's been on a benefit for years and sells a bit of dope and plays spaces all night. He never does anything, and I'm expected to work my guts out so he can afford to to play spaces and smoke dope. And you know that, that's not the kind of thing that you'd hear anyone in Labor talk about. And it probably should be because it's their voters that are now thinking, "I can't trust Labor. They they want to sell me out to everyone that isn't like me, and they don't believe that my beliefs are worth having." You know, you you you've got to be so careful around what you say with the the rainbow community, and you you can't say bad things about transvestites and. Yeah, it's like, oh, come on, just just as Obama said, you know, perhaps we should be a little less judgmental and we should understand that, you know, that the frustrations of people are not the frustrations of the, the well-off educated uh, people. The, the people who are struggling to, to pay their mortgage or their rent and they're struggling to buy their kids um, their school uniforms and, and pay for a little bit of extra. Um, and, you know, they're the people that Labor need to concentrate on, not the people that complain the loudest. Mm. I mean, I can't ever see Labor saying that, but I can see Winston saying it. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think he'd love saying it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, you know, you, you think of Julia Gillard's remarkably um, unsuccessful tenure, and, and I watched her first press conference, and that was in her first speech. Huh? Yeah, she had me thinking, oh, yeah, that's bloody good. Mm. Yeah, and, and I was not predisposed to like the, um, the the Labor Party in Australia. And, you know, other things that she did, which were, were she, she just didn't dwell on identity. Someone said, oh, you're proud to be the first woman prime minister. And she said, well, I'm the first ranger too. And yeah. just took the piss out of the identity people. And I said, yeah, you know, like, yeah, it didn't mean much. She was prime minister, her gender didn't have any bearing on it any more than her red hair did. Well, you know, we saw in New Zealand the media and the and the left wing lovies bent out of shape when Ginny Shipley became New Zealand's first woman prime minister, and we had this crazy construct in the media when Helen Clark was finally elected that she was the first uh, woman elected prime minister. It was just a joke, you know, that they pushed that. But that's what those identity identitarians, uh, I like to call them, do, and. The Labour Party seems to have more than its fair share of them. We've almost got as many as the Lunatic Green Party, despite the you know, this uh, disparity in sizes of the parties. And this identitarian and stuff Lunas is 
has headed them down a cul-de-sac, I feel. I mean, I was reading a, a Spectator article on how progressivism has ankle tapped the Democratic Party, and I'm sitting there reading the article, and I thought, I could just change Democrats for Labour, and it would be exactly the same for New Zealand. Yeah, and, and you know, I think that that's probably where Labour need to start thinking about about what the, the information they're consuming. You know, they need to be consuming things like the spectator and, and people that are critical of them rather than perhaps the new statesman or the guardian, which is affirming their own views. Listen to the views that are different to yours and see if you can apply some of that knowledge. And, you know, it's, it's not exactly hard, but I don't know that they're going to have the intellectual curiosity to work that out. And that's perhaps one of their greatest weaknesses. Now, I... I mean, I, I've talked politics with Michael Bassett for a very long time now, and he said that you know the the, the really smart people in the um, Labor Party when he was serving in the 70s and 80s, they had really inquiring minds. They were before the internet, they were seeking out good international mm. journals and reading them, like the New Republic or the Atlantic. You know, he said one of his colleagues he read the Economist every week, and he was one of the most well-informed people in Parliament because he had an inquiring mind and he just knew what was going on around the world. And that it's harder now with the amount of information that's coming through, but you do need to inquire, um, and you probably need to ration the time that you spend reading right-wing, uh, sorry, left-wing stuff if you're in Labor, and spend more time reading the stuff from the right to find out what they're thinking and why and what their people are thinking, because you've got to win them over, not win over the, the people that have voted for the Greens or um, or the Maori Party, because that doesn't get you any closer to a majority in Parliament. It's funny you say that, because um, just earlier on the show I was talking to Daniel Newman, and he said exactly the same thing, that he finds door knocking, talking to people on the street, their politics may be different from mine but I'm still going to listen to them because they might actually have a solution to a particular problem that's vexing other constituents. And if I, if I only talk to the people that I agree with, then I'm just going to form an echo chamber and we're not actually going to get solutions for the constituents. And I thought that was a, an admirable uh, attitude to have uh, for a local body politician, but indeed for a, a national level politician. You just got to get out there and find out why people aren't voting for you, and you know what you can do to persuade them otherwise. And you know, like, what what is it that will change the, the key demographics vote? Um, you know, Labor managed to lose about half their vote from the previous election. Um, I mean, that's staggering. You know, what was the cause? Think about it. Yeah, well, I mean, what was the cause of it? I mean, obviously there was you know lack of performance and being gaslit. I mean, people were sick of being gaslit you know, being told that their life was better off. I mean, this is what I said to a couple of Labour politicians that, that I was talking to, and they said, oh, you know, we're going well. I said, no, you're not. And they said, oh, well, how, why do you say that? And I said, well, because I'm talking to people that you should be talking to, and they're telling me that life sucks, that, you know, you've told them that um, you've lifted all of these children out of poverty. You go, If you went to any one of those households and said to them, do you consider yourself to being lifted out of out of poverty? They'd all have said no. My kids are going to the same shitty schools. We still live in the same shitty street with the same shitty neighbours. Uh, nothing's changed for us. And and so your grants, your payments, your your stipend that you've given us to lift us out of poverty, it's gone nowhere because the cost of living's gone through the roof. And so you're gaslighting us into thinking that we should be grateful, and we know we hate your guts. Yeah, um, you know, and, and deservedly so. But it does, you know, like, like it, it gets back to that early point I made. You've got to throw a heap of money at uh, Talbot Mills to find out what people are thinking and what you should be running on. And Talbot Mills are, are competent. They'll be able to tell you. But you've got to do the work and you've got to listen. And, and that means you, you need to invest. Um, you know, I, I think that it was really noticeable that um, that, David Farrer tells us that um, when Bill English, after he lost in 2002, National increased its research budget, and they got pretty close in 2005. But after, um, uh, or, or when Simon Bridges was leader, the research budget fell dramatically because they didn't have as much budget, so they just cut it, and they were spending it on all sorts of other stuff. So they didn't really know what the voters were thinking. 
although in, in fairness, they probably did know the voters were thinking we don't like Simon Bridges uh, and it wouldn't really matter what else he did. They just didn't like him. And, you know, that that's unfortunate for him, but it's it's part of what Labor need to look at. Who are the people, when it comes the time to replace Hipkins, who are the people that voters won't look at and immediately dismiss? Yeah, you know, they've got to test the potential leaders and, and it's possible to do. Talbot Mills would be able to do it. And, you know, one of the really, really important things is just a blink test. You know, the time you take the blink, you make your mind up about a politician, which is why you and I will never hold electred, uh, elected office camp. No. And the time that it takes people to blink, they think that that guy's a bastard and I'm never going to vote for him. <laughs> and, you know, and that's that's just how it is. And there's nothing we can do about it. And we're realistic. But, you know, you, you put up someone that, that fails the blink test and they will be as successful as all of the leaders that have failed for Labor in the past. And, you know, the, Jacinda was a phenomenon because she turned up with, Absolutely no policies that they didn't have already, though the policies were useless. Her slogan was, let's do this. I mean, what did that mean? Nothing. What did they do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and, and yet she got about a 14-point bounce in the polls and ends up on 34% in Prime Minister. But that was because she'd done so much work in the media and was very likeable and a very pleasant, lovely person um, in the eyes of the public. And that's the kind of person that you need. You can't have someone that's dour or defensive, who gets angry, and who can't relate to people who, uh, you know, I think that in the beginning, everyone seemed to think that they could probably relate to Jacinda until they worked out they didn't really agree with her. But at least they thought, oh, yeah, she's okay. I wouldn't mind having a drink with her. So who has Labor got? I mean, if Hipkins decides, oh, this is all too hard, I'd rather go and play Happy Families with Tony and decides to go. I'm not sure he would do that, but let's say he did. Who have got Labour got in their caucus now that could fill the role of a credible leader? I mean, it can't be, surely it can't be Grant Robertson. I mean, no, he, no, he's no, going no, to no, go he, down he, in history as New Zealand's worst finance minister. And given the competition from Sir Robert Muldoon, that's, so, that's a tough ask. But um, that's oh, where he's yeah. heading. Um, and Arnold Nordmeyer, but um, no, I, I mean, I think that the, the blink test with uh, Grant Robertson is he looks like a cardi wearing cardi wearing civil servant off the um, set of Gliding On, and I'm sure you'll be able to share the, the photo of Jim of Gliding On, and he's a dead ringer for Grant Robertson. He's not a vote winner. Mm. Um, what I would suggest is, you know, I think that everyone listening to this needs to go and have a look at the, our team page on the Labor website and look at the people that, the, the caucus members and, and look at them and, and the time it takes you to blink, make your mind up about whether you like them or not. And, you know, there are a few there that, that look the part and probably could be quite competent, but, um, you know. Well, it's not Megan Woods, is it? Also, oh, well, no, no, no. She's just, you know, she's like you and I. She just isn't uh, she's just someone awful. that's going to pass the blink test. It's not going yeah, to be Carmel you know, Cipollone either. I mean, you know, she doesn't look anything well, like her photo you know, I mean, for she, a start. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, I, I, I think that, yeah, but but let, let other people make their judgment because my judgment is is that I quite like uh, the look of Camilla Billich and I, I think that um, uh, the, the bloke from Palmerston North who I, I've known people who served on council with him said he was a really friendly, good bloke. Um, and, you know, they, they were national supporters. Uh, he looks the part. Um I'm just not sure that there's many more there that, that actually look, look the part and, and pass the blink test. Yeah, Pene Henere um, looks the part. He, he He's a, yeah, he an outlier, does. but um, the problem that these guys have got is that under Ardern's leadership, the ministers don't appear to have actually done very much, despite the large pay packets. Uh, and all the perks that go with being a minister. If you look through press releases, very few of them did anything. There was about five uh, members of cabinet that actually did all the heavy lifting. You know, they were Chris Hipkins, Grant Robertson, Jacinda Ardern um, to a certain extent, and uh, David Parker. And that's about it. Uh, yeah. Then they brought in, of course, yeah. Megan Woods, who was the campaign chair, and she probably thinks she did a great job getting the number that they got. But everybody else seems to be decidedly ordinary. Um, 
And yeah, I can't, you know, you look I can't at some of the ones see a leader that, coming through there. It's just almost impossible to. Uh, yeah, I can. I can see a leader. I, I think that um, it's not that hard to imagine someone actually being competent. I mean, I'm sure if in um, 1993 we would have been saying the same thing about Helen Clark and feeling vindicated when her preferred prime minister number was two when she had Labour at 14%. And yeah, she's, but, you know, the she greatest just had raw, of our lifetime. She just had raw political talent, though, like, and, and, and a, a bloody-mindedness as well. Um, which is admirable in some politicians. They could copy what Helen does and they could work closely with her in the, the Helen Clark Foundation to to develop the policy and the campaign plans and you know outsource some of the thinking to that organisation as happens in just about every other country in the world. Um, someone we haven't mentioned is Arena Williams. I mean, she was young, um, has potential because she's in a safe red seat. But, you know, one of the tragedies for Labor was that they ended up with a whole lot of useless old people and not much new blood. Um, so I think they had two new MPs. Um, and so there wasn't any or any real new blood. And, and then all the, the list MPs coming in next on the list are, are basically failed members of the previous administration that don't have that much potential. So I, I'm not entirely pessimistic. I think they have some options, but they're going to need to work as hard as Helen Clark did and build the team that she did, and do the you know the the, the grunt work that her team did to put her in a position to win. Yeah, they've only got seven list MPs. Is yeah, it? yeah, and, and there's no new ones. That they will all be retreads if they come back. Um, you yeah, know, will they, they will they Jean Prime, uh, Aisha Virrell, yeah. Willie Jackson? Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, no, I mean the ones outside of Parliament, the the, the list of Labour, uh, the the ones that will come in if, oh, if right, someone yeah, resigns. Yeah. yeah, but they need someone yeah. like they they need David Parker and Calvin Davis and all these other um, you know dead shits really to to quit and go to revitalise. But it's encouraging them to do that. But that's the problem with um, yeah with troffers um, who have been there forever. They don't like to um, have to go and find a new trough to sup at. Yeah, and, and you know they're, they're scarcely going to get uh, much support from the current government because they spent so much time alienating, especially um, ACT and New Zealand First. So I think they probably have a bit of a fatwa against former uh, Labor people uh, getting government appointments too. Unless you just want to be, you know, spiteful and give them a government job so that um, it takes it out, takes them out of the Labor Party and um, shuts them up. But I, I just don't think they've got got an, a, enough grunt there. I don't think there's anybody there who has the capability of making a huge difference to the fortunes of the Labour Party, unfortunately, and maybe they're going to have several iterations of leadership in the next few years. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a fair call. I, I think that where I running Labour's strategy and only getting paid to win, I'd still back myself to be able to nail national um, but they'd have to be, yeah, there'd have to be some quite tough conversations inside the Labour caucus about the need to win rather than the need to the virtue signal. Um, and I'm not sure how that would go. Um, they seem to be very virtuous and not very results orientated. And that's the biggest problem for them is, is you know, we, we tend to look at strategies. Labour tends to look at tactics. Of course, tactics being yeah, short, and- shorter term that to to, but they don't have this overarching strategy. And I think they thought after they got fifty percent of the vote under Jacinda Ardern in twenty twenty that they could go another two terms before their support diminished to such an extent to let National come in um, through the back door. But they lost fifty percent well, they- of their vote in three years. Yeah, you know they they, and they're not alone in that. There's plenty of other. Uh, people that did well in the immediate COVID electric, uh, election and now are extremely unpopular. But, you know, your point about tactics, not not strategy, I think that they're probably going to think that Parliament matters. And basically, Parliament doesn't matter that much. It's it's not going to change many people's minds. You know, the, the parliamentary press gallery gets smaller and smaller all the time because with um, the number of click-throughs being counted now, um, the, the media organisations know that no one really follows what goes on in politics. Unless so, they tell I mean, lies. They, they shouldn't. Well, yeah, but at the same time, I think it's more because no one's interested. You know, it's it, it's not very interesting politics. We may care about it, but most voters don't. 
um, and they sort of emerge near election time and have a look around and think, well, those bastards were useless or, yeah, oh, John Key hasn't done too badly, we'll give him another crack. Um, but, you know, they, in, in Parliament itself, it's important that they don't adopt the Simon Bridges strategy of, of uh, asking questions of the Prime Minister all the time and he just soundly got beaten and got nowhere. Mm. You know, it, it's got to be a question time Serengeti strategy. You've, you've got to feast on the weak. You go after the ones that are um, uh, unethical, incompetent, um, you know, that, and you put pressure on those ones. And, and unless you've got an opportunity to land a real blow on Luxon or Peters or Seymour, you, you, you stick to feasting on the weak. And if that means that the Prime Minister is not really uh, getting too many questions, so be it. I mean, last time we talked, you mentioned uh, the great job Lockwood Smith did with uh, Tato Philip Field and how Helen Clark had to sit there watching one of her ministers basically getting rinsed and there was nothing she could do. And, you know, that that would have frustrated the hell out of her and it will frustrate Luxon if that happens to him. But it just made the point that, that Labor went competent and she didn't sack him quick enough. And, you know, it was, it was a, a wound that National ex- exposed and Lockwood exposed over that long period of time that really made people think, yeah, it's time to move on from, from Helen Clark and Labor. They're, they're just not, yeah, they, they've lost their touch. And, you know, ethics and competence is always where, you know, Newt Gingrich was the one that has probably done it best, where he just mm. spent four years hammering um, his opponents on ethics until they actually got done for ethics because they were unethical. And, you know, obviously you and I have nailed a few people for being quite unethical and uh, quite a few of them, no one actually knows that we're involved in getting rid of them. But at the same time, that's an opportunity for Labor to exploit because there will be people in National that do stupid things that require them to be removed from Parliament. Yeah, that's the, th- the funny thing too about Parliament is the general public don't really care about what goes on in there. But it is important uh, for morale amongst your own team. And, you know, and here's a classic case, right? On Tuesday, during question time, Rawari Waititi got up and uh, and started speaking in Maori, um, 100% in Maori, and asking questions of Winston Peters, who then stood up and said that Waititi speaking Maori is ignoring all the English-speaking people who are watching the broadcast so I'm not going to answer any questions that are asked in Maori. <laughs> and, yeah, and, you know, I think that, that probably appealed to both New Zealand First voters and Maori Party voters, and I think that's one of the big risks for Labor this this term is that the Maori Party and New Zealand First are going to spend three years fighting each other because strategically it makes a lot of sense for them to fight each other, and Labor will get drawn on the Maori Party side rather than just letting them have that ground and trying to win over the middle voter. They'll, they'll be backing up uh, and trying to out Maori um, the Maori party. I mean, and the, the hilarious thing is, uh, too, about Winston being back in Parliament and Labour must be sitting there uh, cringing because they know if they, um, if they go after Winston, if they, if they ask him any questions, he's just going to come back and throw all the dirt that he's undoubtedly got all over them and splatter them from breakfast time to dinner time. Oh, and with a big smile and, you know, there'll be a whole lot of people that don't like Labour just cheering Winston on as, as they've been cheering Winston and Shane on for fighting the um, Maori party and the media. i tell you what I've really enjoyed since the election is watching dyed-in-the-wall blinkered National Party people who were always never Winston, uh, you know, he's corrupt, he's this, he's that. They've got all sorts of stuff. All, every reason in the sun to not uh, vote for Winston Peters or or support Winston Peters and now having to actually like what he's saying and doing um, in Parliament because he's on their team. Yeah, well, I think some of them have probably realised that Winston might reflect some of their views a little bit more than National too. You know, I think that that's something that perhaps hasn't been discussed enough from National's perspective. You know, some some of Winston's views on um nationhood are probably closer to what the median national voter are than the, the, the very free market uh, liberal approach, especially to immigration, that national is taking. But we're not really here to talk about um, national. I mean, we'll, maybe we'll do that in the new year. But, you know, the, the thing here with, with Labor, the, the next major tactical thing that they probably should be doing 
is firing up for the 2025 local body elections and getting their people running good campaigns, building their profile, getting elected, having a reason to be in the media constantly, reminding people of, of um, that there are good people in, in the Labour Party, that they, 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 there are some and they, they are electable. And if they push all their candidates to run for local government, the dodgy ones will get found out. I mean, you and I have found out quite a lot of dodgy local government candidates when we used to run New Zealand's dodgiest local government uh, yeah. candidate award. Um, but anyway, um, you know, that, that, that's, that would be the, the real I, – I would be going out to all the people that want to be Labour MPs saying, you prove yourself at local government level. You get yourself elected. You build your campaign team. You learn how to get out there and, and campaign. Um, and that'll help you because National have won a whole lot of seats that they weren't expecting to win, and those seats will be won back by Labor. But they've got to win some of the seats that are no longer marginal, like Tuki Tuki with a majority of over 10,000 uh, that they lost. You know, and that's not going to happen without someone that is pretty competent and has. they can't turn up three months before the election and run a campaign with any expectation of winning. And while people might go on about, oh, well, it's the party vote that counts, in my view, the, the single best way of raising the party vote in a um, seat is to have a really good candidate running a good campaign. Um, and that's why local government matters. You need to lift your party vote by having good people running good campaigns right across the country. Uh, you can't have too many donkeys running in, in seats that Labor need to be picking up votes. And really, you, you know, even even a seat like Fonga Parole, where you know the National weighs its vote and its majority, you've still got to have someone competent because you know, a few hundred votes might be the difference between an extra seat or, or not an mm. extra seat. And in a tight election, that. You know, those few hundred votes in Whangaparaa could make the difference between a Labour and National government. Well, that, that's the thing, that, you know, that I guess that's why the National Party keeps standing candidates in the Maori seats, although I can't actually work out why, but there, there are a couple of hundred votes for them in it in each of those um, elections. Yeah. In, in a really, it's MMP in a really tight election. It could be the difference between being in government and being in opposition. So, yeah, get, get good people in, in every seat you can and get them all um, uh, running good campaigns, and, and that will lift your party vote. you probably also got to go and have a bit of a quiet word to a few of the people that have just been around a bit too long and are useless to begin with and, and move them on. I mean, um, yeah, Phil Twyford, Jesus, why didn't they get rid of him? I mean, that bloke's just useless. And, you know, Helen White, I mean, Helen White managed to almost lose the safest Labor seat in the country. Just, just Melissa Lee. Comprehensively bad. Yeah, you know, and, and Melissa may be a competent minister uh, and she was competent in parliament, but she's never been a vote winner and, and she almost wins. It's just yeah, absolutely big, biggest belief that that a seat that has had the uh, three of the last, what is it, the last six Labour leaders uh, owning that seat and they've got someone that can't even really you know, beat Melissa Lee by 10,000 votes, beat it by under 100 or something. I mean, Helen Clark and Jacinda Ardern with, were both prime ministers. I'm sure they've got a third prime minister in Mount Talbot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, like, might be a green prime minister in Mount Talbot if they keep uh, Helen White in there. If she's there, then that's a, a very good chance of that. I mean, yeah, that you're right there. David, yeah, yeah. David Shearer represented Mount Talbot, of course. Yes. After Helen Clark, uh, and and also um, Michael Joseph Savage, he represented Auckland West, of which Mount Albert was part of. So Warren Freer again, another um, you know uh, Labour leader in there. So Mount Albert's the the hot house, I guess, for Labour leadership, and Helen White just nearly lost it. Mm. Yeah, and, and she was never very impressive in Auckland Central either. No. So, so, what does Labor need to do? They need to be honest with themselves, don't they, about why they yeah. lost? And that's a problem politicians have generally. It doesn't matter what party; they're often never honest with themselves after a loss. Well, absolutely, and and the honesty needs to really start with two things. The first one is admitting the voters went wrong. Uh, and the second thing is is getting the largest amount of cash possible and taking it to Talbot Mills and say, 
you've got to do the deep-seated research we know you're capable of because you do it for Australian uh, parties. Um, and you've got to tell us the positions that will put us in play again. We want to be in play and we've got to do this professionally. So how much cash do you need and when can we have the results and what's it going to cost over three years so we get our strategy right? Otherwise, it's just a random group or not a random group, a group of, of essentially failed politicians standing around arguing about opinions rather than having any hard data. Just on Talbot Mills, um, last week they released a poll that showed that prescription fees being free was very, very popular, even with National Party voters. And I would have thought releasing that poll before the election might have been more beneficial than after the election when we all knew that National was going to change that. That was a a stated policy. They refused to buckle despite media pressure, despite political pressure. It makes me think that the Labour Party aren't actually directing Talbot Mills to go looking at sensible things. They're actually telling them to go and look after things that the battle was lost at the election. And again, it's yeah, fighting no, no. those things that those virtue signaling things that they're fighting, and not things oh, that voters care and about. Fighting the, fighting the last war. You know, you mm. go to Talbot Mills and say, "Come on, guys, you're the experts. You tell us what you recommend that we pay you to do, not us tell, telling you what to do, because uh, that that won't work." Yeah, you know, when when we talk to Farah, it's always, "Well, Farah, you tell us where we're wrong, not." Oh, we think this fair, and you tell you, you, yeah, you get your polls to tell us that we're right because we're just not. You know, his, his polls are right, we're not, unless we actually get our opinions congruent with what his polls are. And you know, that that's the the bit that I think that Labor probably lack the professionalism to to get Talbot Mills to do the real work that's required. Yeah, they they probably are sitting there thinking, oh, we need to ask this question because if we ask it that way, we'll get an answer we don't like. What you actually need to be doing as a pragmatic politician and political leader is to actually find out exactly what it is that the voters don't like about you guys. And it's it's unpalatable to hear the criticism, but it's vitally important if you want to change and to change that the perception that people have of you. A very basic politics, just very basic that you've got to go and get the um, your polling company to give you the answers. You don't go and tell them what the answers are or what the questions are. Mm. You know, I, I spent quite a lot of time arguing with people that wanted rid of the last government and were, were commissioning polling. They said, oh, well, you want the question asked this way. Well, why? Why, why? Do you want to just have your, your beliefs reinforced or do you want to know what the voters think? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, and whenever I've wanted to do polls, I've always said to David Farrell, you you write the question, right? Because he, he's yeah. a professional pollster. He's going to write a, a question that is going to get that get us to the truth of the matter rather than, as you say, reinforce your, your own particular view or agenda or whatever it is you're pushing. It just reminds me to ask you when you're getting Matt King back on. Um, I mean, he didn't agree with the polls, but, you know, the polls turned out to be, they may not have been perfect, but they showed he had no chance and he had no chance. Election night proved it. Well, the poll that Reality Check Radio ran for for Northland showed that he'd come fourth and that's where he came. Yeah. Right. And, you know, he objected to the way the question was asked. And so we had another poll and it basically took him up a little bit, but it didn't change the result. And, you know, just a classic example of, oh, well, I don't like the question rather than, well, what does the polar actually say my chances are? Well, and, there were there were yeah, four I mean, polls in Northland and they all showed the same thing. And yet he went out to all his supporters saying, no, I'm seeing people on the street that are saying to me, go, Matt, go. Well, you know, Morris Williamson's got great anecdotal evidence of that where you know, he, he gets these new new candidates who say, I'm going great guns. Everyone says they're voting for me. He says, of course they are. No, New Zealanders are polite. They, they'll lie to you because <laughs> they don't want to yeah. hurt your feelings. And um, yeah. that's where yeah, polling yeah. polling allows you to uh, find out what the truth is um, without getting your feelings hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, if you're professional, your feelings aren't going to be hurt. You're going to take it as a data point and you're going to try and modify something to change it, not complain about the number itself. Just to sum up then, what Labor needs to do is acknowledge that they lost, 
that the voters got it right for the voters. And then they need to embark on a strategy that basically involves them shutting up for the next at least six months, doing huge amounts of research, and then coming back with policies uh, and outlines and a direction of, of travel that will give them a pathway to getting that majority. Yeah, and I think that the, the thing that inevitably the pathway will include is is going to be working with the Maori Party and the Greens. So work out whether you want to spend your time fighting for those with with those parties for voters, um, or you want to try and take votes off the the three parties in government, which gives you a better chance of winning than than if you 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 know you you go after the centre left vote already and try and increase your vote that way. It won't get you any closer to being in um, government if all you do is take votes from the Maori Party and the Greens. You've well, got to the, take them off the three parties in government. It's the same situation that National found itself in. They were watching a, a, a resurgent ACT party taking their votes um, because ACT was never going to take them off the Labour Party. And uh, National was sitting there trying to work out how to shore up their support and completely ignoring New Zealand First who were sitting there cannibalising votes off people who were dissatisfied with National Labour and ACT. And then they they had these grand assumptions that it was just going to be a National and ACT um, government and that they'd have a two-party coalition. That was it. And election night, I was sitting there watching Winston laughing at the uh, at the results coming in and saying, oh, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. And yeah. um, he said, we've got to wait till the fat lady sings. And I said, I don't think... Um, uh, Megan Woods has got her vocal cords um, tuned up yet, just quite yet. Winston, he said, "I'm not talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not, yeah. He said, "I'm not talking about here. I'm talking talking about you know, the you know we've got to wait till the final count comes in, and then we'll see where we're at." And he was dead right. You know, absolutely dead right. Yeah. Yep, he certainly was. Yeah, he's a cunning old fox, and I tell you what, I'm enjoying watching him in the house. And um, the Labor Party oh. needs to work out a strategy on how to m- build rebuild those bridges um, to New Zealand first. Otherwise, uh, they, I think they're going to find life very, very difficult being cuddled up to the Greens and the Maori Party. No, undoubtedly. There's just there's not 51% of the population that appears likely to vote for those three parties. Um, you know, so they've got to keep their options open. It depends. Do you want to be in government or not? Well, I mean, the, the, the thing here for them, is the Greens are deluded. They think that they've had their best ever result because of their grand policies and they're fabulous, not because Labour was shit. And the Maori Party is exactly the same. They think they had a grand electorate strategy and that they're going to hold these seats forever. I mean, you know, uh, they've said that to me uh, privately that they're going to hold them forever now. And, And again, it hasn't occurred to them that, they won because the Labour candidates were shit. And and so if the Labour Party corrects that, has decent candidates, uh, more palatable policies, then I see in the next election that the Greens and the Maori Party are going to lose support. The Labour Party is going to grow support, but there's still not enough to get to 61 amongst them at at the current policy settings. Yeah, all they're doing they're, is cutting they, the pie a different way. Zero. That's all. It's the same pie, but it's it's just being yeah, cut yeah. slightly differently. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Well, Simon, thank you once again for coming on and sharing your knowledge and dark arts and yeah, well, Valley Valiant plotting. Well, I don't think it's really all that dark arts. It's like get a truckload of money and give it to Talbot Mills, and then work out how you're going to get to sixty-one votes. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I, I think it might be a little bit more complex for the people in the Labor Party to understand that. And, mm. you know, I think for the viewers, they need to know that uh, neither of us are getting a, a, a stipend from Talbot Mills. We just believe that polling matters. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're a good polling company. Um, it's not our preferred polling company. If I couldn't get David Farrow to do something, I'd, I'd bring Talbot Mills second, you know, but... They're competent guys, and the guys who run that uh, know what they're doing, and um, yeah. they talk sensible game. And the Labor Party really does need to listen to them. 
but yep. you know, yep. the Labor Party will never listen to you and I, but they perhaps they should. Well, perhaps they should listen to Talbot Mills at least. Yeah, that'd be that'd be a good start. Yeah, definitely. Anyway, I better let you get back to your fishing commitments. Yep. Right. Thank thanks, you for taking Dan. time out time out from your your serious fishing commitments and puppy raising. Yeah, yeah. The weather was a bit dodgy today. I've been doing a bit of work, but I'll be heading out shortly. Yeah, there's never a day that you don't. Yep. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Polling, polling, polling. That's Simon's prescription for labour. But will they follow that advice? Time will tell. Don't forget to send comments on Simon's interview to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, just like what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you. So connect with us today.